I think you should never be scared. Even if China is stronger, China will give you only good. You can talk here, not like China, a dictatorship, a fascist dictatorship. This is my book. Uh, this is called in Chinese, 美国经济, in English, American economy. We fail to appreciate history. We fail to think. And it's cost us fiercely in that today, the United States is in deep, decline. The problem with GM is not caused by Toyota or Hyundai Kia. The problem with General Motors is being caused by what? General Motors and the UAW. We're not very competitive. We've been spending too much money on making ultimately worthless stuff. You are making weapons, you are making tanks to kill people, okay? China is actually making cups, kittens, uh, clothes. We gave a lot of people in a lot of labs and factories and things good jobs to make plutonium weapons, uranium weapons, things of this sort for all of these years and it didn't contribute one iota to either consumption or investment in America. It was technical waste and we're now paying the cost for it. So this is the most important reason for the new economic crisis. 这和过去的那个经济危机完全不一样. Our economics has been revealed for some time as being ideological, as ideological as Marxism-Leninism ever thought it be. We take a book and say it's in here, and this is the revealed truth, whether it works or not. Now经济危机了,大家都都要工作了,这时候大家开始注意这个问题了。<laughs> different. <laughs> China is a very promising country. I'm sure in 20 years we'll catch up with the USA. The world hegemon has historically always been the world's most powerful economic nation. The United States hasn't been the most powerful economic nation for a long time now. And it doesn't look like it's going to come back. The decline of the United States as the world hegemon is a necessary condition in order for China to take over that role. But does hegemon necessarily mean empire? Hegemon simply refers to an overarching power. By empire, then, I think it's a little bit like pornography. You know it when you see it. As China unleashes its tremendous talents, as well as the power of its size and productivity. It certainly is assuming a hegemonic position, but I don't think China quite qualifies as an empire right now. But historically, when countries have become hegemons, they eventually become empires. Rome. Britain. Germany. Japan. Russia.
And let's not forget the United States. The Americans don't realize we have probably a good thousand overseas military bases. China doesn't yet have this military capability. But what happens when it becomes the world's number one economy? Will hegemony lead it to become the world's next empire? Or does it provide a much needed balance to American militarism? Should we be afraid? Seeing is believing, so come to China and have a look. Seeing is believing, so let's go. But not only to China. Let's go to the countries that surround China and see how they're being treated. Is China being a friendly neighbor? Or is it sowing the seeds of empire? China already uses its neighbors to play big country politics. Pusan, South Korea. One of the world's major shipping ports and evidence of the successful industrialization of South Korea, whose living standards now rival those of the United States. The US considers South Korea a key ally in East Asia, and it hopes that China will help to resolve the growing nuclear threat posed by neighboring North Korea. Like much U.S. policy, it misunderstands Chinese interests. Korea used to be a tributary or satellite state of the historical Chinese empire, at one point even referring to itself as a Sojonghua, or Little China. It was split in two during the 1950 to 1953 Korean Civil War, with the reclusive communist North allying itself with Russia and China. Meanwhile, the South chose developmental capitalism and relied heavily on the vast consumer markets of the United States to propel its rapid industrialization through export-driven growth. Seoul. The nation's capital has a little more than a quarter of the country's population of 48 million. It sits precariously at 50 kilometers from the demilitarized zone, separating the two sides, in range of the North's artillery. Threat of Seoul's all-out destruction in the event of further conflict has helped maintain this status quo for five decades. Just how serious a threat is North Korea's development of nuclear weapons? In order for a country to become a full-fledged nuclear weapons state, the country should satisfy four conditions. The first condition is the possession of nuclear warhead. Yes, North Korea has acquired nuclear warhead. Second, it should have delivery capability. North Korea has a delivery capability. It has intermediate range ballistic missile, Nodong 1 and Nodong 2. It has a short range missile such as Scud B and C. Third, nuclear testing. But there's a debate on whether it was successful or not. And finally, in order to mount that warhead on the short and medium range missiles, North Korea should possess miniaturization technology. But we believe that North Korea is short of acquiring that miniaturization technology. 
in view of that, we can argue that North Korea is a very dangerous country with potential nuclear weapons capability, but we cannot regard North Korea as de facto, a full-fledged nuclear weapons state. I don't find the Korean situation unstable. I've never felt that there was a threat from North Korea. I've never thought for a minute there was a single North Korean that was even slightly suicidal. Suicidal or not, a nuclear north shifts the balance of power in Asia. Why doesn't China use its growing strength to help U.S.-backed efforts to disarm North Korea? One of the odd things about the post-war world is the Chinese are absolutely delighted to have Korea divided in two. They used to try and maintain this even back in the Tang Dynasty. Korea was often structurally divided into different kingdoms with different support from the Chinese because it led to structural weakness, inability to stand up to a Chinese domination. Their policy is to prevent war and prevent the unification of Korea. Initially, you know, when, you know, let's say, we go back to the January and February 2003, what the Bush administration wanted was you know, press China in such a way that China would impose sanctions on North Korea. China didn't want it. If you're going to work on uh, Korean nuclear issues, you have to understand the Chinese context and the, the fact that South Korea is rich is fine. But if Korea were unified in this rich, it would be the size of former West Germany. That's getting to be a little too big for Chinese comfort. If Korea is a traditional tributary state that China manages through division, then how will it deal with Korea's bigger and wealthier neighbor, Japan, whose rivalries with China have spanned centuries? The answer depends not only on the intentions of the Chinese government, but also on the attitudes of the Chinese people. Like Korea, Japan has traditionally been a part of the Chinese cultural area. But it has also been fiercely rebellious. After Japan became the first Asian nation to industrialize, it used its newfound strength to create a modern empire and subjugate its Asian neighbors. Committing heinous war crimes and killing approximately 30 million Chinese throughout Asia. Understandably, there exists a strong current of anti-Japanese sentiment among many Chinese today. Although Japan was defeated in World War II, it went on to become the world's second largest economy. China, however, is now on the verge of surpassing its old rival. To many, both inside China and out, the 2008 Beijing Olympics were a symbol of China's rebirth as Asia's preeminent power. As part of the Beijing Olympic torch relay, the Chinese decided to bring the torch to Nagano, Japan, home of the 1998 Japanese Olympics, perhaps as a message to the world that the Middle Kingdom was about to eclipse the land of the rising sun. Along with this message came a tremendous display of nationalism in the form of thousands of young Chinese. Many received encouragement and even financial support for their travels to Nagano from various Chinese consulates throughout Japan.
The Chinese government requested that the relay begin at Zenkoji Temple, the same starting point as that of Japan's 1998 Olympics. Actually, the Olympic Games is a very good opportunity for China. Most of the students in China view it as a great opportunity for us to, uh, to present ourselves. However, days before the torch run, the temple announced concerns about the treatment of fellow Buddhists in Tibet at the hands of the Chinese and refused to host the Chinese torch. The event attracted a large number of loosely associated protesters who took the torch relay as an opportunity to voice grievances against China. Uh, generally, we don't like the protesters um, because they try to uh, insert political implications to this non-political event. What do you think about the new railroad that goes to Lhasa? The uh, railroad yeah. is good. However, most important is how to use. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, that should be used for Tibet people. Yeah. I understand that the protesters, they need to get attention of the world, but I don't think Olympics is a good timing because uh, Olympic is a, is a proud of everyone of, of Chinese people. So if you protest it, you are opposing the, the Chinese people. <laughs> Beyond being a window on Chinese nationalism, the Nagano torch relay provided a glimpse into the situation of some of China's various ethnic minorities and begged the question, is China really the unified multi-ethnic nation that it portrays? In China's idea from ancient to until now, we stress harmonious. <laughs> harmonious. You know Confucius? Kongzi, Confucius? Yeah. From his period, 2,000 years ago, he teach us, be friendly. No matter where you come from, all corners of the world, we are one family. We are friends. The Olympics provided an opportunity to see if the harmonious society was a reality or simply propaganda. We headed to Xinjiang, meaning new territory, to watch the Olympic torch relay in Kashgar. Inside Kashgar city, preparations for the torch relay were underway. In a show of ethnic solidarity for the Olympics, the authorities were preparing a large group of minority children, mostly Uyghurs, to come out and show support for the torch on the day of the run.
The event itself, however, was sealed off from the public. by just how different Xinjiang was from Eastern China. And we wanted to know more, specifically, just who were the Uyghurs. Well, to begin with, they're Central Asians of Turkic origin, and they're Muslim. Like other Muslim cultures, the Uyghurs treat guests with the utmost hospitality. And we were invited by a man off the street to share tea with his family. Like many of the minorities we met, he asked that we obscure his face and voice. Can we ask him mm. what he thinks about uh, Iraq war? No, we can't. Sorry about the policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we spoke to another Uyghur farmer and his family. <laughs> He's saying about the little situations, about that cement factory, Kashgar cement factory, about a little bad for the farming. Yeah. Yeah. And cement, cement factories are known for being We knew we hadn't gotten the whole story, but our guide wouldn't give us any more details on what had been said. Although Uyghurs are by far the largest ethnic group in Xinjiang, there are a number of smaller ones. We spoke to a Uyghur-speaking ethnic Tajik at his home. Yeah, he he's happy about the Communist Party of China. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? yeah. Mm. In the past, they make fire in the oven in the house. Mm -hmm. All of the inside of the house is smoke. I see. Yeah. Very bad environment, but yeah. now not like that. Because he has a new house? Yes. Yeah. But so what is the relationship to the Communist Party? Uh, oh, they are very, very satisfied with the party. He said, never be able to find another party like this. It wasn't until we caught up with exiled Uyghur spokeswoman, Rabia Kadir, at the Uyghur American Association in Washington, D.C., that we felt like we got the other side of the story. My Rabia Kadir, my Uyghur, my name is Turkistan. 
Ben benim zeminim, Birmin Tokuzuz Kırk Tokuzuncuyla Xtay hükümeti tarafından, Xtay diktatörleri tarafından besvelen kan. Ende Xtay hükümeti bizden besvagan neyinkin? Şarkı Türkistan'a hazır ki ismi andı Şincan Uygur Abdunum Rayun diyen nam verildi. Bırak bu Şincan diyen isim esli 200 yılın aldı da Mancula besvaga vakti da koyulgan isim. Bu yeni yer diyen isim. Xtay hükümeti bizge bizlerin azatlık çıkardık, Mancula'dan azatlık çıkardık, Militarist'lerden azatlık çıkardık. Sizlerin en bəxtlik kılımız, bizlerin yardım kılımız, sizler şunda sən etkar, pakiz, güzel milletken sizler şunda hoşal kılımız dep şuncilik verdilerini bəlg etdi. Lekin o bəlgen siyasetleri pəkat kağaz üzüldü kılıp, Xtay pütülleyi özgü, özgüçü şu Abdunum Rayin digen isim bilen kapkaldıq ve bəlgen siyasetlerini Yalgan kılıp onun eksincisi gecir akıldı. Do many Tajiks here go to Tajikistan? Evet. Köpdüken Tajikla Tajikistan var alamda? Yok. No, they don't. Yeah, they don't have the permission to go to Tajikistan. Because Tajikistan is another country. This is the small county. So, uh, they have no permission to go abroad. Some relatives of him mm. in Tajikistan, mm. they'll be able to visit him, oh, okay. but he doesn't. Eğer o kohmusa, eğer o adil bosa, nimiş kısılan mı iman kandı çıkamaydı, nimiş kundak takvete sen sen üzerinde sual koygun adaydı da. Tınıştık mı şeydi, batınıştık olsun nimiş kundak kıldı sılanı. A harmonious society should be a society that uh, balance the interest of different groups of people, for example, the wealthy and the poor, uh, the majority and minority people, the urban and rural residents, and also it should be balanced between people and the environment. We asked the Uyghur American Association to provide a retranslation of the Kashgar cement factory clip. And uh, this old Uyghur farmer is complaining about the cement factory right across his uh, farmland because the cement factory, which is new, rebuilt, it's modernized and it's polluting the air, the water, especially the farmland. As farmers, they could no longer grow anything. Uh, he used to grow some uh, melons and some other fruits in the farmland here, but now he could not grow anything. And he is really not happy about it, and he can do absolutely nothing about it. And he's complaining, basically, if the Chinese were living in this neighborhood, uh, then the city government and uh, the environmental protection agency would have taken some measures to prevent the pollution. But now the factory and uh, the city government are doing absolutely nothing because he says the local government officials were corrupt and they were probably bought by the cement factory. So they can do absolutely nothing about it. And uh, it's really sad for them yeah, as farmers. 11. sentyabr vaqasidan keyin Uyg'ur xalqini endi bostirdigan fursat yo'q turgan fursat keldi deb qaradi. Shunga Amerika bilan Amerika Iroq urushidan foydalanib Amerika bilan Birlashgan Davlatlar Tashkilotiga Sharqi Turkiston Islom partiyasi degan bir narsani kirgizish uchun bar kuchi bilan xizmat ishladi Xitoy hukumati. Bu,Maksidin,əməl,qaşırdı。这个,这个责任在布什政府。中国政府从来都有这样的企图,但是一般来说,西方国家是不会跟他在这方面合作。可是非常不幸的是,布什政府居然鼓励了中国政府,就是
Kıtay'nın pırası dep karadı dedi. O çünkü aş, cüngo sızıp koysa sızıp koygan sızıkın bakıdı kan kosakla bakıdı kan. Ola da vicdan demiş kıldı dedi. Ola aş Kıtay'nın alıdı kan menpetke bizde hatta pul kısatıdı. Wait a minute. Pakistan gets favors from China? We were confused. We thought Pakistan was supposed to be a key U.S. ally, not China's. It's also a predominantly Muslim country, so at the very least, wouldn't its people sympathize with the situation of the Uyghurs in China? Just what type of a relationship does China have with Pakistan? We decided a visit to Pakistan was in order. Um, there are two nations which are fighting in the world. One is America, one is China. So America is using brutal way, which is war. And there is a lot of losses. And uh, China is using a peaceful way and civilized way where there is no loss. They don't interfere, okay? Uh, in other country. It is not like America. <laughs> it is not like America who interfere in the entire world. The United States is one of the largest donors of foreign aid to Pakistan. But most of this money is spent on American-made arms and weapon systems. The Pakistani military justifies such spending as being necessary to defend against the imagined threat of its arch enemy, India. American aid, therefore, does little to help actual Pakistanis. Fortunately for the Pakistanis, there are other nations that have undertaken development projects that have contributed greatly to the infrastructure and quality of life in Pakistan. China has been our friend for the last 50 years. If Pakistan had any problem in the past, China came and uh, it solved the problem of uh, Pakistan. The Karakoram Highway is the highest international roadway in the world. It runs over 800 miles from Kashgar in western China to Islamabad, Pakistan. The KKH is a joint venture between China and Pakistan that provides a vital link between the two countries. A quiet graveyard just off the highway commemorates the 82 Chinese workers who lost their lives in Pakistan during the 20 years it took to complete the construction of the KKH. The Karakoram Highway would not exist today were it not for the funding, hard work, and sacrifice of the Chinese. Before the construction of KKH, the people of northern areas led a very poor life. After the construction of KKH, we experienced different sort of changes, culturally, economically, socially, and politically even. Our northern areas, there is no industry, only jobs, little jobs, and small homemade things. China is the only one of the country who provide the very cheap stuff for our people. 
We are six hours drive from our border to China. So easily we are going to. China is so near for us. So we want to business with China. In addition to inexpensive consumer goods, Chinese technology is also brought to Pakistan through the Karakoram. The Chinese technology is very cheap. So the local authorities and Pakistani government accept uh, their bids and they allow them to establish their uh, projects. Uh, there is uh, an agreement between Chinese uh, government and Pakistani government uh, for widening the KKH, uh, for lying the railway line, as well as gas uh, pipeline. So the local in population is very happy. They will benefit it. The Chinese have also begun other mega projects in Pakistan such as investing $200 million in the construction of Gwadar port on the southern coast of the country. Gwadar is considered by the Chinese as, as their avenue to a warm water port, a port which is strategically close to where oil supplies go through, a port which gives them access to the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea, a port that they can use as a trade corridor. So there's a whole idea of linking Gwadar through uh, Balochistan onwards up through northern Pakistan, through the Karakoram Highway, going on through Xinjiang and onwards into Central Asia. While most of these plans have yet to become reality, they reflect the ongoing and serious interest of the Chinese in maintaining close ties with Pakistan. One region of Pakistan that remains in great need of developmental aid is the Northwest Frontier Province and the federally administrated tribal areas bordering Afghanistan. This region is infamous as a center of the Pakistani Taliban. The American-backed effort to expel the Soviets from Afghanistan in the 1980s provided weapons and training to the Afghan Mujahideen. But the needs of the impoverished Afghan refugees who fled to neighboring Pakistan went unnoticed in Washington. They start their work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so, uh, they work for 8 hours a day. Uh, do you go to school, does he? He doesn't go to school. Well, he? he said that they don't have money to afford going to school, like their fa his father is very poor. Now all these guys, look, they should go to school, but they are working with their parents. And now it's almost one o'clock in the afternoon time, and the temperature is over 40 degrees. And they are working for their family because they have to uh, buy food or buy clothes or other requirements of life. Those who cannot afford to attend public schools find that their only opportunity for an education lies in the Islamic madrasas. The madrasas provide a free education and books, room and board to the students. Students begin by memorizing the Quran. Once they have done this, they study other subjects like history, logic, philosophy, and the hadiths, or sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. The government doesn't, doesn't help us, the government doesn't support us, the government doesn't fund us. If the government provides us fund, then we will start engineering subjects or science, uh, science medical subjects or other subjects or computer subjects. If I'm helpless, so I have to take the hand of someone, okay, so that he can help me and fight for me. And if you have one side China and one side America, so we'll, uh, we will be in the favor of China. We'll support China. We will work for China.
یو کلنټن جی ډیر زبردست حکومت کړی دی ډیر زبردست پروګرام یو جی د دې خو ټول د اسلام دشمن دی او مونږ مسلمانانو ته خو ډیر زیات تکلیفونه او نسخانو نه جی ورکړل نو مونږ دا وایو په چاره دې زمونږ کو ټول راشي کنه نو د خدای په حکم نو ته به مونږ یو زبردست سره There was a party among the Pakistani generals when they were chasing you know, glasses of wine and they said to each other, they hoped very soon they will send the American naked ass from Afghanistan. China's reputation as a friendly neighbor does not stop at Pakistan's border. It has successfully been out competing the U.S. for the favor of Afghanistan itself. After nearly 30 years of war, abandoned artillery litter the landscape of Afghanistan like tombstones marking the graveyard of empires. We have enough experience with the war. We uh, fought the Soviets. At the end, that superpower was broken. Despite billions being spent on so-called aid and development, the country has become increasingly dependent on opium production, with many blaming corruption and even NATO forces for the country's inability to move forward. America wants to solve everything by the gun. Gun is not, does not bring solution. Gun increases the problems. Like in Pakistan, the Chinese have stepped in to fill the developmental void left by the United States. Right now, in this reconstruction period in, uh, in Afghanistan, Chinese, they are holding some construction company. They have built, they are busy in some road construction. They are not even telling our government who should be a minister, who should be a governor. All they are saying that they want to see a developed and prosperous Afghanistan. However, like its Western peers, China's interest in Afghanistan is not purely humanitarian. Rich in mineral resources, Afghanistan remains an undeveloped source of raw materials in a world in which they are increasingly scarce. It is Afghanistan's copper that interests China. The metal is used in all aspects of modern life including coinage, jewelry, housing, transportation, electronics, and medicine. Afghanistan's untapped Ainak copper deposit in Logar province is said to be one of the world's largest, valued at almost $90 billion. که شامل بلاک تکتونیکی کابل هست در اینجا سه معدن بزرگ وجود داره که عبارت از معدن عینک، معدن دربند و معدن جوهر البته معدن مثل عینک بزرگترین از این معدن است و این ساحه The China Metallurgical Group has bought a 30 year lease for 3 billion dollars the largest foreign investment in Afghanistan's history The royalties alone will cover almost half of the Afghan government's annual budget. و یکی کمک ها در چارچوب ارزش ها با در نظر داشت ارزش های افغانی که اسلامی و افغانی ما باشد یک کسی با ما کمک بکند از یک طرف
On July 7, 2008, the Indian Embassy in Kabul fell victim to a suicide bomber. Many, including the government of the United States, believe the attack was carried out in concert with the ISI, or Pakistani Intelligence Service, as an act of terror against India. When I come out from the shop, I see a lot of people was uh, running outside the shop. A person was injured uh, uh, in his head. He was, uh, he was uh, full of blood. A lot of people was running uh, in front of the hospital. So uh, the ambulances come, the police security uh, surrounded by the embassy and they was not allowing any people. Most of the wounded were treated at the nearby Jamuriat Hospital, built by China as a gift to the Afghan people. Fortunately for Pakistan, the U.S. decided to look the other way, and American help was nowhere to be seen. Will China show the same level of tacit approval? Or will it chide its Pakistani friends for sponsoring an unprovoked attack against Afghanistan and India? home of 1.2 billion people. In 20 years, it will have a bigger population than China. Its economy continues to grow year after year, and it's the world's largest democracy. Could India provide a cultural and strategic counterbalance to China? One of the main balancing forces in the emerging world of Asia, South and East Asia, is going to be India and China, that neither is going to feel comfortable with one achieving a position of superiority, least of all any claims to hegemony. I would assume Asia is a target for the Chinese. Uh, they would like to put Asia under, under its control uh, in economic terms, in political terms, in uh, strategic and military terms. Uh, this is where China has been active. India is very conscious of China and rise of China and also very much conscious of the difficulties that India has had with Pakistan. It is interesting to see that China and Pakistan have shared a very important relationship over the last four decades and in some ways there is a suspicion attached in much of Indian mind as to what is the modus operandi, what are the motivations, compulsions of such a strong and close relationship uh, and often insinuation that it is perhaps anti-India. And perhaps that's the real reason why China is so friendly to Pakistan. Beijing's influence also reaches into Delhi's internal politics. Dharamsala the home of the Tibetan government in exile. After the Chinese took control of Tibet in 1959, the Dalai Lama and his government fled. In 1959, when Chinese invaded Tibet, we have very poor military. If we had a very strong military in Tibet during that time, I think that Tibet wouldn't have been occupied.
Although the US and the UN were actively trying to prevent the spread of communism, they did not help the Tibetans. India did, and an enraged China made them pay a bloody price, culminating in the 1962 Sino-Indian War. After Dalai Lama walked into India, the overall China-India relations deteriorated completely. The Chinese claim that they are bringing economic development and modernization to Tibet and its feudal society. China criticizes us because China says that you know, Tibet was a feudal country, feudal society, there was no people were exploited. And of course everyone, you know, for us, you know, we, we agree that Tibet was not a perfect society. But each year, scores of Tibetans risk disfiguring frostbite to cross the Himalayas into India. Today, refugees from Tibet continue to find new homes in Dharamsala. So why do so many of them come here? My name is Lisa Young, I'm from New Zealand and I've been volunteering with La for almost two months. La is um, sort of a community college for adult um, Tibetan refugees and um, Tibetans who have just newly arrived in India um, who are not eligible for the school system here because they're too old. It's, so it's for refugees from 18 to 40 mainly and they teach um, free English and Tibetan classes, French also, um, computing classes and um, job vocational training and they hear about the education system that's been set up for Tibetans in India, which is separate from the Indian school system. And that's quite uh, often the impetus for them to make the, the exile trek over the Himalayas to India. Um, yeah, that and the two, two main reasons are better education and seeing the Dalai Lama. Because the education in Tibet is mainly in Mandarin and they don't get much of a chance to speak Tibetan and uh, they basically have to learn the Chinese curriculum and a lot of them choose not to, they don't want to. They want to learn about Tibet and its culture and it's definitely a lot more preserved here, especially in Dharamsala. Many Tibetans feel that their ancient culture is being systematically erased by the Han Chinese. So these are the teachings of Lord Buddha and it has 108 volumes and these are the commentaries written by the Indian masters. It has 225 volumes. So some texts, they, when they carry it from Tibet, you know, it, uh, it was damaged by the water, you know. How many of these types of texts did the Chinese destroy, do you know? Uh, I can't say the exact number, but there are 60% uh, 60 is destroyed by the Chinese. So they just destroyed, they just burned and they just throw into the water. You know? India's ability to operate independently from Beijing is eroding. If you were to look around um, Asia, uh, China has replaced the US as the largest trading partner for almost every country in the region. India-China trade has been growing rapidly and a trade route has even been opened that directly connects India and China through Tibet. Indeed, India-China trade has crossed India-US trade in terms of sheer numbers. There's a growing relation, trade relation, bilateral relation between these two countries. I think that gives Chinese a certain power which people will look over their shoulder twice before they do or say something that gets Beijing upset. Chinese have done, committed a lot of atrocities and they've been allowed to get away with it because they've been isolated for so long. Um, there was a, there's a period where no one knows what went on in China and now that they've opened up they're still sort of acting with impunity because of the economic incentive, go, countries aren't willing to speak out. Trade has lately become very China driven. India is always very careful about 
the Tibet issue and also with its vis-a-vis -vis with its relation with China? I think it's a tight rope that New Delhi has to walk between its uh, increasingly closer relations with uh, Beijing and also keeping Tibetan refugees population satisfied as much as we can. In March of 2008, there were protests across Tibet before the Chinese hosted the Olympics. Many Tibetans in India decided to show their support by marching towards Tibet. You know, when we led this march, you know, we marched, we walked for nearly four months. Indian central government, yeah, they have sent us an order saying that you can't move out of this district, Kanga district. India will not allow Indian territory to be used by any Tibetan protesters to undertake any political activities. At Beijing's request, Delhi had its own police enforce the wishes of the Chinese government by cracking down on the protesters. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, China, is so very, China is very clever and it can use any country for their own benefit at any point of time. So when we were reaching the, 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 the district border, very early morning the police stopped us. So from our side, because we were trained, what we did was we sat down on the road in the middle of the, you know, middle of the road and we started praying. And some people were crying. We all got locked ourselves, we started praying, and that made it impossible for them to get angry, you know. And, you know, they have their own responsibility, they have their duty to perform, they have to arrest us. I think perhaps I feel a bit of an affinity to the Tibetan people because my parents went, or at least my mother, I don't know about my father, went through the Cultural Revolution. It's, it's just weighing on me a little bit because everyone thinks I'm Tibetan when I'm here, which is lovely because I've really grown to love the Tibetan people. But before I came here, I was warned by a lot of local Indian people and also tourists that had been here. When I told them that I was Chinese, they were really surprised. Some people were actually saying quite extreme things, like that people might think I was a spy from China, um, and that people would react negatively here, they would get angry with me, and they, if, if I'm not angry, then they would be staring at me and they'd make my stay here very uncomfortable. I had to decide whether I was going to tell people here that I was Chinese, and unfortunately I decided not to. And I think that was a mistake um, because I think they would have accepted me fine. Like they've, they've got friends in Tibet that are Chinese and they're very open and welcoming of Chinese people because that's what the Dalai Lama teaches them, to show compassion to everyone, your enemies and your friends. India is not the only country where China tries to control Tibetans outside of its national borders. Nepal is home to 28 million people. It is sandwiched between two giants, India and China. India has always had a significant influence on the culture of Nepal, its economics and trade. 
But China has become increasingly active in the politics of Nepal. With much Chinese attention placed on the 20,000 Tibetan refugees who reside there. The T word is predominant vis a vis China's relations with Nepal. I think what the Tibetans are doing here, what the Americans are doing here vis a vis Tibet, is of utmost concern to the Chinese. Tibetan refugees began coming to Nepal after the Chinese occupation of Tibet. The Jawalakel camp in Kathmandu is home to a thousand refugees. And about 500 are employed there, manufacturing woven carpets. The government of Nepal is wary of being seen as helping the Tibetan refugees too much. To counterbalance our overwhelming political and economic dependence on India, we try to lean over backwards to be nice to China. It's, it's pretty clear that uh, the, the Tibetan protests, um, the Chinese don't like it. They're uh, extremely sensitive to this, and that sensitivity is very easily brought to bear on the Nepal government. So if the Chinese are going to be angry about Tibetans running around in Nepal, we're willing to give that a sympathetic ear and crack down on Tibetans here, as long as China is happy. The Nepali government's treatment of Tibetan protesters is clearly different than its treatment of Nepali protesters. Police ignore burning effigies and tires and blocking roads, as long as it's done by Nepalis. Although the treatment of Tibetan refugees in Nepal may seem similar on the surface to their treatment in India, the mechanism behind it is far different. For 10 years, a bloody civil war raged across Nepal as Maoist rebels took up arms against the king and the Maoists gained popular support. After the king was forced out of power in 2008, the Maoists were elected to run the new government. The party's name is a clear tribute to China's Chairman Mao. During the Civil War, Sherpas camping in the remote snowy passes of the Himalaya reported seeing caravans of ponies loaded with guns crossing from China into Nepal during the dead of night. Our uh, party's policy, the international policy, is, uh, is uh, um, eco-distance relation. Not more close to the India, not more close to China. India has historically been the major influence on life in Nepal. So in practice, a policy of equal distance will require Nepal to realign its interests more closely to China's. While the Maoists claim to have brought democracy to Nepal, in reality, their behavior is consistent with that of their namesake. Maoists stormed the offices of the Nepali Times and physically assaulted Kunda Dixit and his staff in an attempt to silence the press. China was able to benefit from the Maoists' willingness to destroy the freedoms of expression in Nepal. In response to pressure from China, 
Nepal agreed to ban all anti-China activity on its soil. China is bringing Nepal within its orbit. But what happens now? Once China controls a territory, what's in store for its future? Let's take a look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the world's most developed cities. An icon of Asia. The Pearl of the East. Hong Kong has also long been at the center of imperial disputes. It was taken by the British Empire from the Qing Dynasty after the First Opium War. Post-World after reunification, the Chinese promised to preserve Hong Kong's highly successful laissez-faire economy and its political autonomy, rule of law, and Western-style civil liberties under a paradigm that would be dubbed one country, two systems. This is why Hong Kong is so crucial. It is a litmus test for Chinese intentions. When China gains control over an economy or political system, what happens? Can China be trusted to respect that system's autonomy? Or will China try to dominate it? And unlike other parts of China, perhaps the best test is not how ethnic minorities are treated, but rather religious minorities, like the Falun Gong. If you went to, you bumping into one Hong Kongese on the street, or ask some kind of human rights of uh, activists in Hong Kong, what's the most sensitive test of a one country, two system is Falun Gong issue. The Falun Gong is a modern Chinese spiritual practice that was founded in China in 1992. So this is a, a spiritual uh, practice. Uh, that has uh, its deep roots in school of the Taoism or the Buddhism. Our main principles are three words, uh, truthfulness, compassion, tolerance. And uh, we believe that's the principle that the entire universe operates under. Its explosive popularity scared the Chinese Communist Party. On the 20th of July, 1999, it was banned and a brutal campaign of persecution began in the mainland. Falun Gong practitioners sought refuge all over the world, including Taiwan, Japan, the US, and even Hong Kong. Compared to China, Hong Kong remained an island of tolerance for the Falun Gong. Even today, as busloads of tourists from the mainland come to visit Hong Kong and take in the view from Victoria Peak, Falun Gong practitioners are free, under Hong Kong's constitution, to peacefully demonstrate in support of their beliefs, including displays about human rights violations by the Chinese government. On the surface, it would appear that one country, two systems is working. Or is it? One of the issues raised when you introduce Hong Kong is whether or not the, the Chinese idea of one country, two systems is stable. I don't think so. 
Under Beijing's pressure, the Hong Kong government routinely violates its own constitution by refusing entry to Falun Gong practitioners who try to visit the territory. Every country have an immigration control. They are entitled to refuse someone, no problem. But racial and uh, religious discrimination cannot be a reason of refusing people's enter. So when we talk about one country, two systems, it's like, uh, you know, gradually really disappearing. Is one country, two systems starting to become one country, one system? 但是收回香港那个九十年代的时候，香港的政治色彩并不浓。但是现在的香港的这个残存的民主，成为好像中国民主的一个导火索，一个重要的榜样。所以共产党现在需要，呃，消灭香港的民主。Teresa Chu herself was deported when she attempted to visit. Chinese leader Hu Jintao was visiting there. We have one thousand Taiwan Falun Gong practitioner. From six-year-old kid to eighty-something aged old lady, were violently repatriated from Hong Kong to Taiwan. They use like some kind of blanket, wrap me like this one from here until the banana knees. In detention room, we have no water, no refreshment, no place to rest. So you can see how hostile they are. It's not like a free society. It's not like a pearl of the East. Why? Because the black hand, the invisible hand behind Hong Kong Sun government, the Chinese regime. 当中国进行经济改革，西方对中国开放那个呃呃出售技术和产品的时候啊，香港存在的意义就不大了。所以中国要收回香港。我想，香港的民主可能在未来十年中会逐渐消失。After being defeated by the Chinese Communists, the KMT, or Chinese Nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, fled to the island of Taiwan and designated Taipei as the capital of the Republic of China in 1949. The KMT ruled the island under an oppressive authoritarian regime. But it was successful in creating rapid economic growth that has made Taiwan one of the most industrialized countries in the world. Eventually, the KMT's iron grip gave way to a democratic system in Taiwan, creating the first true ethnic Chinese democracy in world history. most important thing for every, for each citizen is to be independent. I mean, yourself. So you have to be independent and then the country be independent. 
So I think that's the most important thing. I'm not that kind of a nationalist, independent guy, but I mean, I want an independent country with all the independent citizens. Think independently, and do independently, and vote independently. Try to think everything independently. Don't believe in media. So I think the citizens should be smarter and should be try to control the politicians, try to use the politicians as the tools to achieve your ideals. An authoritarian regime and rapid economic growth leading to Chinese democracy. Could Taiwan be a model for the future of mainland China? If democracy exists and, um, and is established, more is strengthened in this region, I believe it's not just, it will not just benefit um, the people in Taiwan, but also benefit surrounding countries, especially China. The youngsters on the mainland, they're, they're gradually changing their world view. You know. They're not that inward looking anymore. Or they can see by themselves what's going on in, in Taiwan, especially in uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, democratic uh, developments. It's a country with the same language, the same language, the same language. So its culture is a very big deal for the people. In the long run, we can change the very nature of the Chinese communism and hoping that someday that the man in China can be converted into a, a free and a democratic society. We believe that China is moving to a, a right direction that develops the economy and uh, improves the quality of life of everyone and at the same time promote uh, democracy and equality. As the Chinese economy has grown, a process of normalization between Taiwan and the mainland has begun. I hope that the mainland and Taiwan could come together to work out a better system and also be not more connected. Investment, trade, and political exchange have grown at a rapid pace. This is a very critical moment for us to uh, develop uh, a healthy and a better relations with the uh, Chinese mainland. But is this ultimately good for Taiwan? Or does economic integration with China pose a threat to Taiwanese democracy? 共产党使用了很多，除了武力的压力以外，还使用了这个金钱的引诱，引诱台湾的商人到中大陆去给他们特殊优惠的政策做生意，让他们赚大钱。回过来投来再来影响台湾的政府。我想这个这种形式呢，
uh, and that we are making ourselves utterly dependent upon it. The world is, is, is relying on China a lot at the moment and it's, it's too afraid to really speak up for Tibet or for any of the other issues. I believe that the international community should continue to talk about the human rights problem, the democracy in China. If not, I believe you are just helping to create a new empire. And I, I believe it's not good really for the 21st century. Yeah, 